At wheels through time, there are hundreds of motorcycles and dozens of cars, each with a story all of their own. From the rarest antiques to the most iconic styles, we are dedicated to telling the story of these old bikes. Never in a million years did I ever expect this motorcycle to show up at the Wheels Through Time Museum. Um, the museum consists, of course, of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rare American motorcycles, all in running condition. Um, the gallery in front of me, the inventor of the Indian, his personal bike, Will Henderson's personal Henderson, William Ottaway, who developed the Thor, his personal Thor motorcycle. William Ottaway actually later went on to work for Harley Davidson and made Harley Davidson famous. But the bike we're starting today, or hopefully starting, and we're gonna be taking this from the top, is this motorcycle right here. It's a 1909 Harley Davidson single cylinder, uniquely built and entirely built as a one-off motorcycle. Now we're gonna try to start this bike today. I've done nothing to this bike. I've had it for about two weeks and uh, I've admired it and I've looked at it, but I've never done anything to it. So I'm gonna go through a few basic steps. I'll tell you what we'll be doing in just a little while, but a little bit of history in moving backwards with Harley Davidson. Claiming they started in 1903 building just a handful of bikes is probably true. In 1904, they built a few more. In 1905, they built a few more. There's actually a book called The Legend Begins, and I can kind of quote chapter and verse from this book on some of the production on Harley-Davidson, um, which goes as follows. Um, and I'm gonna jump to 1907. They built about 300 motorcycles. That was the year Harley-Davidson was incorporated. In 1908, they built 450 motorcycles. There's about seven known in the world today. Now, 1909 is a very special year in the fact there's less 1909s than there is 1908s. And I think this motorcycle has a, is a big part of that story. In, by 1910, they were actually able to increase their factory. And the book says, and this was written by Harley Davidson uh, in about 1970, the 3,168 bikes were built five different models. 1911, when you go to the book, they don't have a history on how many 1911s were built, and then it goes on after that. By 1914, they were building about 30,000 motorcycles a year and were the largest motorcycle manufacturer in the world. But going back to 1909, when you read the book, it says there's five models. Some had the tall wheels, and by the way, the bike right behind the 1909 is a 1910, and I got that off the table today for some comparative uh, you can look at them comparatively as I talk about the bikes. You'll notice this bike has smaller wheels. These are 26s, those are 28s. You'll notice the bike is entirely smaller, the gas tanks are shorter. But most interestingly about this motorcycle, this engine, frame, handlebars, gas tank, rear wheel, and every part on this motorcycle is uniquely built for this motorcycle and there's not another one existing. Now one of the real standout points, Harley Davidson from the first day, 1903, they use what's called a flat belt drive. So when you look at the drive system, it's a flat belt. It has an adjuster which will give you tension. This motorcycle has a V-belt. Other motorcycles in the day, such as the Wagner, there's several here, uh, had a V-belt drive. Uh, the manufacturers of V-belt drive motorcycles thought the advantage was with a V-belt, you don't need a tensioner. When you give it gas, the V-belt pulls, and when you back off the gas, it releases. And that was the theory that many of the companies used. And this is the motorcycle that Harley-Davidson built to experiment with that theory. Um, I've kind of dubbed this the 1909 fork in the road bike in the fact that Harley-Davidson uh, to my research, never built another V-belt motorcycle, and I've never seen any written documentation that they ever built this motorcycle. So it is known that the theory of a V-belt and a flat belt, with a flat belt, you have tractability. You can tighten the belt, vary your speed. If you're in a jam, you tighten that belt real hard, it'll make the, pull, the motor pull harder. And with a V-belt, it's really more or less on or off. And I think Harley-Davidson realized there was no future in on and off. They had to have a tractable motorcycle. And of course, 1910, 12, uh, 
belt drive, and of course, uh, in late 1912, they started to develop the chain drive motorcycle, and it wasn't, I think, until 1980, Harley went back to a belt drive motorcycle, which they still use today, and many of you people are riding. Um, so, with all of that being said, that's kind of a background on this motorcycle. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the unique features on this bike, and then I'm gonna to go to work on this bike right in front of your eyes, and uh, within about 10 minutes, I think this bike's gonna run. Um, the first thing I really wanna share with you about this bike is the engine. The engine, as you can see, is nothing like that engine. Secondly, uh, there, of, the, of the four or five 1909 Harleys known, none of those motorcycles had a mag, what's called a magneto ignition. The thing behind the engine right here is a magneto. Now, uh, in 1910, like this one, it's a battery ignition. They did offer a magneto ignition, but the magneto was made by the Bosch company, and Harley-Davidson continued to use Bosch magnetos all the way to the 30s. Well, this doesn't have a Bosch magneto. It has a Hertz magneto, and they were manufactured in Paris, France, and they had a division, I think, uh, somewhere on the East Coast. So, in Harley-Davidson's experimenting with magneto ignition on this motorcycle, they chose a Hertz magneto, and nobody has ever seen anything like that. So, technically, it's also known as the first Harley-Davidson with a magneto ignition. The carburation in 1909 on most Harleys, although it was optional, Harley-Davidson built their own carburetor. It was a big, bulky unit, took a lot of space up right here. But in 1909, late 09, it's noted, they changed to a Shebler carburetor made in Indianapolis. And this motorcycle has a Shebler carburetor, but this Shebler carburetor is nothing like any Shebler carburetor I've ever seen, nor is the connection that connects the carburetor to the engine. Also, moving down, this is what's called the cam chest. So inside of that are the working components of the engine, and there is no cam chest on any Harley-Davidson that's really shaped anything like that. The gas tanks are shorter, the handlebars are different, the forks are a different length, the wheels are different. In fact, not only are the wheels different, but the rims are manufactured in a way that I've never seen a rim manufactured that way. The way the spoke the, are dimple, uh, dimpled into the rims, just quite unique. And then, of course, the V-bell drive, the pulley on the motor, the rear wheel pulley, really nothing like it in the world. Now, what I wanted to mention right now is um, uh, kind of how I got this motorcycle and uh, the, the known history that I know. On the left side of the uh, toolbox, there's a, a, a little tag that says Egbert's Harley-Davidson. Now, Egbert's Harley-Davidson was in Minneapolis. They started around 1910, and uh, Egbert's closed up, I think, in around 1978. Anybody here from Minnesota? Got it. On one of the television shows we did called What's in the Barn, we actually found uh, some old uh, Harley-Davidson or an Indian clocks from the Egbert store in Minneapolis. Um, so uh, in 1977, when that um, company went out of business, there was a collector out of Pearland, Texas named E.J. Cole. And Cole was known as the guy with all the cash, went around and scooped up a lot of motorcycles. Cole's still around and alive, but a year ago, March, he sold his entire collection at an auction in Las Vegas. I think the collection netted about $14 million in about six hours. This motorcycle was part of that auction, but that's not where I got the motorcycle. Um, within that motorcycle auction, there, there was a, a 1908. It was kind of known as the Mona Lisa of all Harley Davidsons. I think it sold for around $600,000. There was a cyclone that went for the same, and there was literally one bike after another that brought six figures, and I'm not talking with ones in the front. A lot of them had twos, and there were some threes. So it was a prestigious auction of rare motorcycles, and I was at the auction, and when this bike came up, when I saw this bike there, what had come back to me was in 1978, I was at a big event up in Davenport, Iowa, a swap meet in Davenport, Iowa, and Cole showed up with a big van full of stuff, and, and uh, serendipitously, he was on his way back from buying out everything at Egbert's and he was selling some things to recoup some money. If you look on the second floor above the rare racing bikes, there's a set of AMA flags that came from Egbert's. Well, this motorcycle came from Egbert's, and I vaguely remember seeing this motorcycle in Cole's truck in 1978. 
So if you go fast forward to 88, to 98, to 08, to 16, nearly 40 years later, this bike turned up again at the EJ Cole auction. Uh, the bike was bought by a good friend of mine, Vince, uh, from uh, Sacramento area. Um, uh, I just didn't have the dough to buy it. I can't recall what it brought. And uh, when I thought I might have been well enough to call Vince and buy the motorcycle, he had already sold the motorcycle. Well, never in a million years, four weeks ago, Vince called me up and he said, hey, you know that 1909 that you like so much? And I said, yeah, I remember that bike. Like I had lost a lot of sleep over this motorcycle. Like people always say, what's the one bike that you're always looking for? And I always say there isn't one, but if there was one bike that I was ever sorry I wasn't able to get, it was this one. Of course, now it's here. So Vince and I made a happy trade and the bike showed up here about two weeks ago, uh, just exactly like you see it. The bike was repainted uh, probably in the 50s by Egberts. If you look at the fenders when we're done, you're welcome to closely look at the bike. You can see some old rust pitting. So really the speculation would go, how did Egberts get it? And my only thought, and it's surely speculation, is that sometime during the tenure of the Egberts being in business, might have been in the 30s when Harley was having hard times. Um, and Harley, of course, as we all know, kept a bike from 1903. They have, they say, their first bike, and they have one of every year. As part of the Harley-Davidson tradition is keeping models from every year in their million dot, multi-million dollar museum in Milwaukee. Um, so how did Egberts get the bike? My speculation is this, at some point, with Egberts being very good friends of the founding fathers of Harley-Davidson, they saw something in this bike that the founding fathers didn't. I think, and I'm speculating, that the founding fathers realized that it was a fork in the road bike, the V-Belt had no uh, future with Harley, and they either sold it to him, gave it to him. Egberts uh, restored the bike in the 50s, and here it is today. So with all of that being said, now it's time for me to go to work, and uh, it's not gonna take long, because there's not much to do. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out is all old motorcycles, like this one, all old motorcycles have a drain plug where you drain the oil, and uh, if an engine is overfilled with oil, it won't start. Um, so they always had a drain. If you left your oil on, okay, accidentally, uh, overnight, then you'd have to drain your engine and you take the oil you drain, you'd put it right back in the oil tank and recycle it. This is the only Harley in the world that doesn't have a drain plug, it has a level plug. Now many old bikes had a level plug where you would uh, fill the bike up, pull that plug out when oil came out, that's level. So this is the only known Harley Davidson with a level plug. Now. I'm gonna pull that level plug. I've not, I have done no work on this motorcycle. I have touched this motorcycle none since I've got it. And I'd like you to know one thing. There is no rocket science. These are my tools. A wooden screwdriver came out of a Harley tool kit and the wrench, just an old wrench, probably from the 20s. These are the two tools that I'm gonna to use to start this motorcycle. So the first thing I'm gonna do is pull the level plug. There's nothing like using old tools. And usually a hammer is present, but. Hang on, I gotta get down here. That plug's in there pretty good. It worked. Out comes the plug. No oil yet. That's oil. Okay, the plug goes back in. Now there's really only two things left to do. Anybody in the audience want to guess what they are? What? Gasoline, what's the other one? Right, so now I need a volunteer. How about this guy with the beard right here? Come on over here, hold the spark plug. No, you don't have to do that. This is the only Harley Davidson motorcycle in the world that I know of where the spark plug is not a straight thread. 
Everybody knows about spark plugs. You screw them in and the threads are the same all the way down. Well, if you look at the thread on this spark plug, it's a tapered thread, like a pipe thread. Um, very few motorcycles had that. One of the motorcycles here that does have this, that I call the rarest bike in the world, and this is up near there, is Oscar Hedstrom's personal Indian, also has tapered thread spark plugs. Come on over here, partner. Okay, what you're gonna do, this won't spark you. If you'll just sure. hold that, just like that, just ground it. And then, I'll, and then you let me know if that baby sparks. This is where we all need a group prayer. <laughs> Got a spark. That's all we need. Um, Woohoo! I'm excited. Now the one thing I noticed when I was turning, you can just let go of that for the moment. One thing I noted when I was turning that is it was pretty stiff. And I just thought of one more thing I'm gonna check. So I'm gonna put a little lubricant on the cylinders. If they're gummed up, this will break it free. But this motor ought to spin real easy. In goes the spark plug. With the old wrench, the hundred year old wrench. I thought the spark plug was pretty cool. It's got an X on it. Right there, a champion X. Probably made in, uh, probably made in Iowa. Okay, so. Gas O lean time. Need a volunteer. How about this little guy right here? Come on over here, partner. You hold the funnel. All you gotta do is just hold that funnel just like that. But don't push it in. You wanna hold it up just right about there, okay? Because that way the air will come in. I got 110. 110 octane airplane fuel or some kind of special fuel. I think that might be enough, son. Here, set that can off to the side over there. You got it? Beautiful. Okay, so the next thing you do is you turn the gas on right here. Okay, I got the gas on. Now the next thing you gotta check, we're gonna see if the gasoline filled up the carburetor. Because if the gas doesn't make it to the carburetor, Got nothing. Just like that. Overfloat the engine. Anybody getting nervous? I am. The carburetor is a pretty simple affair, but Hoping the carburetor is not clogged up inside. I really don't believe it is. We're gonna try it right there. This little guy here. Well, that's the choke, but we're gonna leave it in. Okay, we're ready to roll, guys. Woo! Retard, advance, off and on. That's a pretty emotional thing for me. And uh, not only does it run, but it runs absolutely perfect. And the, uh, 
the thought of those four men to build a, a motorcycle like this in a company that's lasted 107, 114 years. This is a real testament to that moment. Thank you, everybody. Wow. That's amazing.